Good morning and welcome. Uh, it is Friday the 19th of January, the final morning of the World Economic Forum's annual meeting. And I think we can all agree the beginning of a very long year for democracy in 2024. We are gathered this morning to have a conversation about what are the themes that are putting democracy on the ballot this year. My name's James Harding. Uh, I've been a journalist who's come to Davos for, for many years. I'm the editor of Tortoise, a slow newsroom trying to understand what's driving the news. And I feel incredibly fortunate to have this group of people to help us try and understand these issues. Uh, Ian Bremer is the president of the Eurasia Group. Um, you'll probably know that uh, what Ian writes is required reading for anyone trying to understand geopolitics. Um, Rachel Botsman uh, was an expert on trust before we knew that we needed experts on trust and has been a lecturer at Oxford University uh, on that subject. Uh, Mark Leonard runs the European Council for Foreign Relations. If you're trying to understand the cross-cutting issues of what's happening within European democracies, uh, Mark's the person to go to. Uh, Alex Soros is the chair of the board of directors of the Open Society Foundation, probably the organisation that has been most devoted to the uh, reinforcement of the institutions of democracy around the world. Uh, and Secretary Rajesh uh, Kumar Singh is uh, the secretary for the promotion of industry in India and and as we know, although there's quite a lot of attention on one democracy this year, the biggest uh, democratic exercise is going to be happening in India. And so I look forward to talking to you about that, Secretary Singh. The way we're going to do this, just to give you a sense of the structure of the um, three quarters of an hour that we've got, is we're going to try and talk about some of the themes that unite or if you unite democracies but possibly divide us the challenges to democracy we're going to take some time i hope just to consider specifically what's happening in india specifically what's happening in europe but we're going to leave a chunk of time to talk about the united states when i paused and said why are we doing that rachel said because it's the united states so i hope that gives you a framework and we'll give some time at the end to make sure people have uh, some room for some questions and comments but ian why don't you start? When you look at the challenges to democracy, what do you think by the end of 2024 we're going to think are the, uh, the issues that have been common themes uh, in elections this year? Well, uh, there are so many reasons why democracies are facing challenges, but most of the elections as I see them this year aren't particularly problematic. Right. I mean, you know, when I look at Mexico, when I look at Indonesia, when I look at India, I mean, these are three very large countries and the democracies are going to be held pretty smoothly and, you know, they'll be seen as legitimate by their populations. Uh, but, of course, uh, that isn't true increasingly uh, in the most powerful uh, country in the world, the United States. And I I'm not sure we'd be having the same kind of panel if it wasn't for the nature uh, I mean, U.S. democracy is in crisis, um, and I, I think that you can focus on inequality, and inequality is something that plays through all of these countries. You can focus on identity politics uh, and migration, and that certainly plays through the advanced industrial democracies and in creating a lot of backlash. But the, the one, if there was one theme that, that worries me the most, and, and, and I experience it most sharply in the U.S., but we see it in other places. It's, it's much broader than that. Uh, it's that as human beings, um, we uh, are, we become civic individuals through nurture, mm. not genetically. Genetically, we're very different from that. But through nurture, we become civic beings. And, and we have institutions around us um, that shape us, that allow us to connect to people around us. Um, and if you look in the United States over the last 40 years, those institutions have fragmented and they have lost trust. And that is true equally with the church and the media as it is with America's political institutions. And, and for, for most of my life, I, I feared that they were not being replaced by anything. But they are now. Um, and that's worse. Because what nurture is being replaced by is algorithm. Hmm. We, as human beings, are being disintermediated uh, by institutions that are not interested in creating civic individuals and community. We're being disintermediated uh, by algorithms um, that, for, for whom human beings 
are actually incidental to the process. They're products. Um, and and we're, 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 we're consumers, we're stores of data, um, and, and we're meant to engage with these things and how it affects us as people and the planet um, is actually a real-time experiment that's being run on us and on democracy right now. If I had to focus on one thing that I think is creating an, a, cri a true crisis of democracy in the United States, that is the one thing I think it is. Rachel, will you pick up on that? Yes. Technology and trust, is, is Ian right? Is that what's causing so much polarization and so much division within politics? Kind of. <laughs> um, so I want to pick up on what Ian said about the loss of trust, um, because there's a different or deeper picture of what's going on. So when you read the media, we're bombarded with this narrative that trust is in a state of decline. So you'll read surveys that trust in government in the US in the 1960s was around 70% and people trusted it to do the right thing. It's now around 22%. In the UK, they'll say it's around 30%. OECD countries, 40%. So you look at that and my mind thinks this, right? State of crisis. Well, this isn't actually what's happening to trust. Because trust, I'm not a physicist, I actually fell physics, but it's, it's like energy, right? It, it can't be destroyed, it changes form. Trust is not like dry January or drinking coffee. You don't say, I'm not gonna trust today. So it's not that trust is in a state of decline, it's being displaced. So when I think of trust and democracy, I don't think of this, I think of like a complete fragmentation. Now, this is really important because when we start to think of solutions, we have to think of trust being distributed. So it's not a question of whether people trust, and this is, I think, where you're going at, Ian, it's where people place their trust. So just to quickly give you sort of a historical perspective on this, if you think about democracy and you think about trust, it maps to three really clear chapters. You have local trust and local systems of democracy, then you have institutional trust, and then you have what I call distributed trust. And this is what technology inherently wants to do. It wants to take trust that was very top-down and linear and centralized and distribute it. Now, we've seen this happen with media and information. We've seen this happen with value flows. Now, when those two things get disrupted, it's going to disrupt democracy. Now, the thing that frightens me is that this creates a vacuum of chaos. And what we might call untrustworthy individuals, they understand these dynamics. They understand how to take all these fragments and this chaos and create some kind of absolute truth, create some kind of false certainty that is often mistaken for power. And that's where trust flows. So it's not like people stop trusting, they just start to flow in different directions. And, and just explain then the read across from that problem with trust to how that actually plays out in elections. Well, it's very hard to control information, right? It's, I mean, that's the central um, problem. Um, it's very hard to control messaging. Um, and then the three parts of sort of the democratic process, if you like, the vote, the institution itself, and then the people, there's sort of this chaotic energy around it because it's not like we just look up to these institutions and we're really deferential to them. We don't know whom to trust and therefore voices that cut through are often clear and absolute and they push against something rather than stand for something. And that's what scares me is it's sometimes the most untrustworthy individuals that rise up in this state of chaos. Mark, I'll come to you in one minute. I just wanted to ask Alex first. I'll come to you in one second, Mark. But uh, Alex, when you look at it, it ju just across the piece in terms of democracy, how concerned are you about the things that Ian and Rachel are talking about and what, if anything, can be done about that? I, um... Uh, it's good. Yeah. I think... I want to be polite here. Uh, I think to blame technology is an easy cop-out. Um, you know, to think of technology as something separate from humans, you know, I think, you know, is, uh, is, a, um, is a cop out in, in saying that, you know, uh, technology has been a threat, uh, you know, uh, to, uh, you know, or has been a supposed threat to, you know, humanity since the invention of the printing press, which has been, you know, 
much more disruptive than anything AI is, is going to do in regards to um, uh, human civilization. And I apologize uh, because um, you know, my real background is as a historian. Um, but um, you know, I, um, I, don't think that that's the, I don't think that that's the fundamental. I don't think the technology is the fundamental issue uh, in, in democracy. Democracy is messy. I mean, you know, democracy is about contestation of ideas. It's about uh, plurality. Um, it's about people having different truths, actually. Now, mm. um, <laughs> fundamentally, uh, how society lives together um, civically um, in those in those contestations um, is you know is obviously uh, is obviously um, you know quite uh, quite uh, you know quite tricky. But I think that if we play too much on this disinformation card, we're taking responsibility away from ourselves to actually create a narrative that inspires people to vote and to believe uh, you know in um, uh, in uh, in democracy and democratic um, institutions. And on the institutional part, I think that we can talk about uh, institutions as these abstract things, but institutions are also about people. Mm -hmm. And um, you, know, um, you know, we just heard this, this, this point about untrustworthy people, and we talked about things in the United States like, you know, like um, checks and balances, which aren't written anywhere, but are customs. And one man, Donald Trump, literally came in and just took that, you know, took that, took that all away. Um, you know, so, um, you know, so, um, you know, but when I see this, you know, when I look at this, um, you know, um, you know, uh, more globally regarding, regarding, you know, regarding democracy, I also say to myself, when was this great time that everybody got along so well and, you know, things were going so, so great? I mean, I think, you know, um, um, you know, the, um, you know, I think that we really have to be careful here in, you know, in this nostalgia uh, for a time, uh, you know, for a time past, because a lot of the reactions we're seeing in society are actually reactions to positive, uh, to positive things like, you know, like equality uh, for women, um, you know, uh, and, um, uh, you know, and greater diversity, uh, which come with backlash. Um Mark, you wanted to weigh in. Let's take, by the way, some of those ideas that Alex raises and come back to when we talk about the US in particular. But, Mark, how do you see all of this playing out, these themes, particularly in Europe? So, I, I think the European situation is quite interesting because we have our big European elections this year, one of the big elections, not as big as India or the US. Um, and people are quite nervous about it. And I think there's sort of two things that people think are going to be true of these elections. One, is that they'll all be about migration, and the other is that the far right is going to uh, dominate everywhere. And I think, actually, neither of those things are necessarily true. Um, I think the first point about migration is, is maybe uh, something which links up with what Rachel and, and Ian were saying earlier, which is that migration is a kind of big issue. It's a crisis. There's a trauma from 2015, as well as what's happening today. But for Europeans, it's just one of, of five big crises that we've been through over the last few years, alongside the economic crisis, climate emergency, the COVID, the war in Ukraine. And what we found um, in our polling work is actually that a lot of these crises are creating kind of long-term identities and political identities. And um, one of the things that seems to be defining politics now is, is less a kind of idea of hope of the future and these long timescales about what could happen than the trauma of a kind of brutalised public that, that, uh, whose identities have been shaped by these things. And migration is the dominant trauma in, in Germany post-2015. But what's interesting is, is that all of those five crises have got constituencies which are, you know, between sort of 70 and 80 million people around Europe. If you look at the whole European, um, uh, they're more or less the same size. If you think about these crisis tribes of Europe, they've got different um, dynamics within them. They lead to different kinds of voting behavior. But I think what it points to is a sense that actually, rather than having societies that are centered around you know, a, a more kind of enlightenment idea of what democracy looks like, where people are seen as individuals and they have collective interests which can be projected into the future. What increasingly uh, is happening with politics is that people are looking at these kind of 
uh, uh, you know, the, the individual is being kind of broken down into a whole series of, of different things. I think that's one of the things that does come from technology. And what you try and do is assemble a kind of winning coalition on a particular issue at a particular time based on some aspect of their identity, which you think you can get to, tr to, to trump other kinds of identities. I think that's very, very difficult for a kind of progressive politics if you want to get people to think about the future. If, if you have such a fragmented sense of what the reality is and people's identities are... Um, but anyway, so I, I think that the migration isn't going to be the key issue. And then I don't think the far right's going to win either. I think there will be, you know, nine member states in the EU, a third of member states where the far right tops the polls. But uh, if you look at it, we've built a, a model and it shows that actually the results are not going to be vastly different from what they are at the moment. The three kind of big... Uh, centrist blocks, the socialists, the liberals and the, the centre-right blocks will have over half of the seats in the European Parliament. They'll be the ones who decide who get the, the big jobs, who's president of the European Council, president of the European Commission, um, the EU high representative, president of the European Parliament. There'll be a small shift. They'll go down from 60 to 55% of the votes and there'll be a lot of Sturm und Drang about the, the, the move towards the, the far right. But I don't think that it's going to be as important as a lot of the national elections which are taking place in, in, in Europe this year, particularly in countries like Germany, actually, where these elections, the local elections in... in um, but, and the British election, you can see how the Polish election actually completely changed the mood that people had about the far right earlier. So I, I would look probably more at those things than at the, the European elections, if you want to understand what's happening with Europe. Mark, I mean, I think this speaks to Ian's point right at the beginning, that there are lots of elections, but there's probably only one that changes everyone's view about democracy, and we'll come to that in a minute. But can I just ask, I, I'm struck by your five big crises, and I just wanted to ask you about one in particular. It, it's striking here how quickly at the forum meeting we sort of moved on from thinking about the disruption of COVID, and yet in the politics you sense that's really changed the way in which people think about government and their relationships with power. You know, I know that the European Council on Foreign Relations looked at this. What are you finding in public sentiment around post-COVID politics? So we've been doing polling on COVID from the very beginning. At the beginning, it was one of the crises. So a lot of these crises um, uh, either help incumbents or they help uh, uh, the, the kind of opposition. And the war in Ukraine and COVID were incumbency-friendly um, uh, crises. So at the beginning, they led to a surge in support for governments everywhere. And then over time, that kind of uh, dissipated. And what's interesting, if you think about long political COVID, the most kind of the strongest identities actually seem to be uh, to do with uh, the loss of trust in elites from particular segments. So there's sort of anti-vax. Uh, libertarian uh, elements in our society because you had this weird uh, political cross-dressing during COVID where all the kind of liberal politicians like Emmanuel Macron and people like that came out as kind of authoritarians that were shutting their societies down and all the real authoritarians like Marine Le Pen and the AFD and Nigel Farage and people like that all kind of reinvented themselves as, as tribunes of, of freedom uh, against uh, uh, lockdowns, against compulsory vaccinations in different places. Um, and I think that that probably is going to be the, the kind of longest term legacy of it. Interesting. Um, Secretary Singh, um, I keep on hinting at the impact of the US uh, elections, but of course the Indian elections is a kind of uh, creature unto itself, both in terms of scale, but also the system uh, of the election. Can you just talk us through what you think is on the ballot in uh, India in 2024? So, uh, before I talk about that, let me also say that I'm an outlier on this panel. I'm the only civil servant. And I'm also the only person who's actually conducted elections quite a bit. In the first 10 years of my career as a civil servant, I've done about 15 odd uh, elections at, at different levels, as returning officer, district election officers, etc. As you as you hinted, it's a very broad mammoth exercise that India does with 900 million people, 10 million odd uh, polling stations. The reason why it runs so well, in our opinion, is that it is run entirely by the bureaucracy, and it is run on the basis of standard operating procedures. The the, the criticism that is normally made about the bureaucracy in India that it is very bound with red tape, procedure-oriented, rule-bound. Now, those become strengths during elections because it is you're doing very narrowly tailored uh, tasks 
uh, you are operating on checklists. And that combination really works. And obviously, we've uh, delivered elections over 75 years, which have always been credible. Uh, people's faith in the election process and in the election commission of India has actually gone up over the years. And the process is also incredibly efficient because we are able to uh, generate our election, uh, election results in literally half a day because we use electronic voting machines for the last 25 years. Coming to your question about what is on the ballot, bread and butter issues are on the ballot in India, like everywhere else. It's, it's basically economic development. But yeah, I mean, uh, the, the record of the present prime minister in terms of uh, uh, economic development, in a way, has already been sort of uh, uh, validated, in a sense, by the recently concluded elections in five states, where unexpectedly he won you know, the majority of those. As a civil servant, therefore, I can't predict, or I should not be predicting results. But uh, you know, the writing is pretty much on the wall. Things are looking pretty uh, clear. But yes, uh, in terms of uh, credibility of the process, I think there's not much doubt. Issues of disinformation, of uh, use of money power to, to a certain extent, those, of course, are important in India as well. And those are issues which uh, probably uh, don't affect uh, the election results as much as we think, because people generally, even if you, you know, people go around sometimes giving cash hand handouts, candidates do cash hand handouts or liquor bottles in the night to their uh, constituency. Usually the, uh, the voter will take that, but he will vote as he pleases, because he's very confident that his uh, voting is going to be anonymous. But, uh, and Secretary Singh, what about the points that Ian and Rachel were making right at the beginning, this idea of you know, the destruction of institutional trust, the explosion of distributed trust. Do you feel that that's coming in India already, you know, part of the politics of India? How do you read that? Uh, I don't think trust in institutions has gone down significantly in India, particularly as far as the election commission is concerned, because it's a constitutional body. It's, it, it has very strong uh, sort of uh, constitutional protections in the form, in the sense that they have the same protections as a Supreme Court judge. You can't remove them. They have a fixed tenure. And they run the elections entirely free of political interference during the election process. Essentially, the entire state and uh, central machinery start reporting to the election commission during that two or three week period when elections are uh, being held. So I wouldn't say that trust has gone down. But across the board, if you say that the uh, trust in, in institutions have uh, sort of started coming down, yeah, I mean, maybe to some extent it, that that's true in certain cases. But in general, India is an outlier. I think trust in elections, in its institutions, is probably fairly uh, robust in India even today. Thank you, Secretary Singh. Le All right, let's, le let's turn to the United States. Um, uh, everyone in this room has a uh, point of view and probably even more questions than points of view. And I suppose I'd like to explore uh, those. Um, Alex, I'm going to ask you first, what, what do you think we're missing in understanding what's happening in the politics of 2024 in the US? So, um, you know, it's uh, interesting to be at, uh, at Davos because in, in Davos, Donald Trump is already the president. Uh, being, uh, again, <laughs> again uh, in, uh, in, uh, in, uh, in the United States. Um, and obviously, that's, uh, that's a good thing because Davos, you know, the Davos consensus is always wrong. Um, <laughs> obviously, I think people understand which side of, uh, of the political ledger I'm on, um, I'm on in the United States. But I think when, you know, when we look at the election in the United States, it's way too early. I mean, you know, uh, we're talking about, we're in January, um, you know, this time in 2020, we didn't know the Democratic candidate uh, was going to be. I think there was, there was probably it was a lot of naivete among people in thinking that there was somehow going to be a contested Republican primary against Donald Trump. Donald Trump owns the Republican Party. Uh, and um, we're in something I like to call the Trump cycle, because I think even um, if, and I believe if the institutions hold when he loses this election, he'll also be the Republican candidate in 2028, and maybe even in 2032 as well. Because, no, I mean, what's the way out for him? I mean, he either winds up in prison or he winds up in power. He's not going off on some beach somewhere and retiring. I mean, this, you know, this is this man and this is the, the you know, the party that we've, that we've created. And we will deal with this issue now, um, you know, uh, for, uh, you know, for, for, for a while. But on the, on, on the election itself, let me let me just say that you you know we are uh, you know we're not a uh, you know um, a, uh, a democracy where the person with the most votes wins. It's a democracy of states, and we have the electoral college. And um, you know there are, there are 50 states, and there are about there are 
maximum uh, seven, but probably six states that matter, and a minimum, you know, three plus the the the, uh, the uh, Omaha um, uh, um, uh, congressional district, which goes into the to the to the college, and um, you know, so if you look at kind of the, the blue wall states, Michigan, Wisconsin, Pennsylvania, the ones that Trump. Uh, you know, won and took away from Democrats when he beat Hillary Clinton, the one that Biden has won back, and the one that, you know, Democrats have, have, have overwhelmingly won back since, uh, since, you know, since then. I would really look at, I would really look at those. I would also look at Arizona. I would also look at Georgia. And I would also look at uh, Nevada and possibly uh, North Carolina, because you have a, have a, you have a Democratic, uh, you know, go uh, governor's race. And if you look at those states, um, you know, Joe Biden's got a pretty good map. Um, you know, uh, Joe Biden's got a pretty good map. Um, you know, uh, Arizona, the, you know, the population has changed by, by 50 percent demographically from between 2016 and 2020. Um, and, um, you know, uh, even though people think that, you know, that um, Herschel Walker Senate candidacy was some sort of outlier, um, you know, when you speak to people in Georgia, Trump is really, really toxic. Um, and you, you know, obviously a very, very strong um, and, and, and organized uh, African-American um, uh, uh, vote. But actually, I think if you want to look at one state which will really test where the election is, it's Wisconsin. Because um, if Joe Biden's able to win Wisconsin, it should mean that he's won Pennsylvania and Michigan, because if you look at the, you know, uh, Pennsylvania and Michigan are, 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 more, uh, are more democratic than Wisconsin is, and if you look at the vote, Share of 20, you know, 2016, 2020 it was under it was under one percent. So, who's ever doing better, in, you know, in Wisconsin will probably show in which direction uh, the election goes. Uh, you, you talk about the sort of naivety as regards Trump and his relationship with the Republican Party. I have to confess, one of my forms of naivety was thinking around Thanksgiving. You know, the Bidens are going to get together as a family and say, "Look, you know, we've had a really impressive run. The presidency is probably under." Um, reported in its achievements, but the right thing to do is to hand over and allow a Democrat contest. Um, as observant people will have noted, that didn't happen. Um, why has that not happened, and how worried are you about Biden as the candidate? Um, I mean, I think that's not. I think that's not happened for a couple of reasons, and I think that that is because Biden actually has and has a particular advantage. Um, in a uh, in a polarized electoral environment, which is actually that he's not polarizing. Um, you know, you could say a lot of things, you know, uh, you know about Joe Biden, but the Republicans have basically created, um, you, you know, uh, first of all, him himself. He's, you know, um, you know, you can't say that he's, you know, one of, you know, someone that's trying, you know, to, you know, force your children to have some sort of sex change or, you know, or, or you know, or something. I mean, you know, he's a, you know, he's a pretty down to earth, uh, you know, uh, you know, uh, person, and also, he I mean, he just. We don't actually have somebody in the Democratic Party that's actually polling so much better than him or better than him. I mean, even, you know, someone like Gretchen Whitmer, who, you know, is, you know, one of our most popular governors, she doesn't have name recognition. Incumbency has real power and validity in the U.S., in the U.S., uh, you know, in the U.S. Um, the system. But in, if the 22 election and, you know, no election is alike, you know, if, if Republicans are going to run these extremist candidates and they have Trump, to have somebody like Joe Biden who, you know, is not a very polarizing, uh, you know, figure, and Republicans have basically said is essentially demented. I mean, the whole age thing, I think, will actually backfire because um, they've set a standard where, essentially, if Joe Biden just goes up, to a, goes up to a debate and puts three words in a sentence together, he's kind of punctured their idea that he's this man that can't even walk and, you know, and talk. I mean, I mean they've really set the bar so low that, uh, you know that he can he can completely over uh, you know over over perform it, but I think Joe Biden is, is is running because he believes, and I think it's you know it's the it's I, I don't think many of us have a good counter argument that he's in the best position to win. Ian, can I ask you to do something quite? This is quite an unfair thing to do. Map out twenty four as you see things unfolding, um, because I think one of the things that's most difficult about dealing with the U.S. presidential election, just emotionally, is the uncertainty. Well. I, I fully agree that there's a long way to go. Uh, and so, I mean, I think it's 60-40 Trump right now, but I have very low confidence around that. You can push me down to 50-50. What should be relevant 
uh, to everybody here, and especially the Europeans, because if Trump wins, it is an unmitigated disaster for them, more than any other country in the world, in my view, um, countries, um, is that Trump can win. He can easily win. So, I mean, you cannot write this guy off. And if, if what we've seen from the Davos consensus is that it is actually going to mobilize people to start thinking about the implications, God bless that, right? That's a good thing. Now, um, just yeah. Across, what those implications are? For well, I, I mean, for Europe specifically, yeah. I mean, this is a guy that has zero interest in supporting NATO, zero interest in supporting the European Union, sees Zelensky as a personal political enemy because he refused, right, to, to uh, support um, the investigation of Biden and of Hunter. I mean, those are very serious things. He says he's going to end the war in a day. You know he's going to do that? He's going to say you've got to accept the outcome that Putin wants. And when that doesn't happen, he's pulling money. That's an existential problem for the Europeans, right? So these are very, very serious issues that are at play. Um, but, but in terms of how 2024 is, because that's 2025 uh, and, and, and forevermore, but 2024, one thing we can say, which is underappreciated, is that Trump is almost certainly going to get the nomination, right? And when that happens, he is going to become dramatically more powerful than he is now. Now, I believe that Trump is likely to be convicted before the election. But Trump convicted when he already is the nominee and when the Republicans are all, therefore, completely behind him. And you saw that yesterday on a panel with the head of the American, what was it, uh, Heritage, right? Who was, was clearly, I mean, I mean, utterly fact-free and knows better, but he is performing because he wants a position. You just saw the beginning of what a lot of serious Republicans that you think you know are about to do in about two months. And when that happens in an environment that is unprecedented, Alex said, when was it so good before? From this perspective, it was always better. Because we are seeing unprecedented things happen in the United States every week, sometimes every day, and we're normalizing them. We didn't have January 6th before. We didn't have this level of people believing in fundamental conspiracy theories that undermine the fabric of democracy. That is new. Uh, we don't. We never had a president that was twice impeached, thrown out. We never had 91 indictments against the president. Do not normalize this. Can, can Do I, not. Can I, can I ask you a, a self-involved media question in that regard? There's often this debate about, do you put Trump on air, do you not put Trump on air? Do you put Trump on air, but you delay so that you can check, you know, fact check? Culturally, I don't think that's the challenge, particularly for TV broadcasters. The challenge is the outriders, the people who are commentators, um, advocates of his candidacy, who you have to put on air because they're part of the debate, but they themselves may be pushing arguments, may be pushing ideas that, as you say, fact-free. What, what's the responsibility of the media in this situation as regards normalization? Uh, I mean, the responsibility um, is not to simply drive headlines uh, that are clickbait. I mean, the fact is that if you go through the clicks and you read the pieces, um, from Fox or from the Wall Street Journal or the New York Times or CNN, they're often pretty decent, straightforward coverage. But the headlines, which is what most of the people are reading, are, are, are frequently fact-free. Um, and they're very polarizing. They're very tribalizing. That's a problem. But, I mean, look, I, we've lost this battle in the United States right now because the coverage is going to be dominated by Trump because he is the person that gets the money. And the media is in trouble financially, so they're going to cover it. You remember Les Moonves saying that from CBS. It's bigger now because the media is facing a bigger existential challenge. That's what's happening. Rachel, w when you look at this, what's the way in which the world will interpret what's happened in the United States? What will be, I, I was going to say, lessons of democracy in the United States? Yeah, can I just come back to what Ian said? And I should say I lived in the States for 10 years and I worked for President Clinton. And I think my experience from working with him is how much a politics is a performance. And I think the thing that I find deeply disturbing from this conversation, and you mentioned this, is the normalization of low expectations. It's not okay that he's an old man. Our expectation shouldn't be that he goes up and he says three words and he doesn't fall over, right? Like, that's very low expectations. I wouldn't be surprised if Trump wants to go to prison and be in power. I keep having this image of, the orange man in the orange suit trying to run the White House. And he'd love that, right? Because that's the ultimate theater and performance. The media's not going to cover that. So 
you know, how do we raise expectations in who our leaders should be? How do we actually get back to a society that says, you know what, trust is mine to give. I'm going to think about who deserves that trust because they're actually trustworthy. So in some ways, I think this lowering of expectations of what leadership looks like has a massive impact all around the world. And it has a massive impact on younger generations that look at public service, look at civil servants, look at leadership and think, well, I don't want to be a part of that. I don't want to vote for that. I'm just going to disengage. Can, can I, uh, forgive me, Anna, there's one point that you made, and I dropped the ball on it, which is the tension between popular will and the law in democracy. You, you, you were talking about the possibility of Trump becoming the Republican nominee and at the same time being convicted. And I think a lot of people around the world are deeply confused about what the US legal position is on that. Are, are we right in thinking that even in the event of convictions, none of those things stand in the way of his winning a US presidential election? I, I don't know. I mean, I think he can still win an election and be convicted, That would have right? to be tested yeah. in the Supreme Court. Well, yeah. Yeah. I mean, there's nothing that says that he can't. I, I suspect the Supreme Court would punt on it if they were forced to until after the election was over. And ultimately... Well, punt on it means... Meaning, into 25. if he's convicted, it's hard for me to see the Supreme Court ruling and saying he's not going to be able to serve until the election is over. And this is so key because democracy often depends on trustworthy systems being able to hold untrustworthy individuals, right? And so what Trump is a master at is sort of completely rattling and bringing down sort of uh, the structures of institutions. And this would be the ultimate act. I can, I can be elected from prison. It's the ultimate screw you. <laughs> I know, you know, the, the, the Georgia case in particular, because he can't pardon himself uh, because it's a, because it's a state, uh, because the state uh, case, the state RICO charge, um, is is going to be is going to be an ultimate test. So I think you know if if he wins and if these if you know the, we're going to be in a constitutional crisis. Um, I want to make sure that we got. Time. If not a bigger, you know, violent crisis. You yeah, know, no, it's it, it's but it's it's a very curious thing, Alex, because if you sort of I read a lot of what Timothy Snyder, who I know has been here, writes, and you think to yourself. This, this contest between democracy and the Constitution that seems to be playing out, and it's hard, to, it's hard to interpret. I want to make sure that we've got some time for questions or thoughts. If people have things they want to say, please just um, catch my eye, and uh, I'll make sure to bring you in. I'll just ask you to say, uh, say who you are, um, if you've got any thoughts. Yes, there's a just on the front here. I just wanted to know... Yes, so will you just say your name? Ah, I'm Vivian Girardier, okay. and I'm just today here. I'm happy. <laughs> <laughs> I have some question. Uh, what is the artificial intelligence doing with our democracy? Um, can I send that to Ian, if I might? Because you did that survey, didn't you? Do you see, did that survey, and, and I had a look at AI and its impact on... We did, um, and, uh, you know, view uh, overwhelmingly from the survey uh, was that it was reducing trust um, in elections, not increasing it. That's still very early days. Um, look, I, I accept the fact that it is not technology that is to blame. Some technologies are centralizing, some are decentralizing. We have the communications revolution, which actually helped facilitate democracy, the Arab Spring. We now have surveillance technology, top-down, which is, you know, actually atomizing, destroying, uh, centralized trust. That's undermining it. But the thing that worries me the most on AI is, and you heard it from Sam Haltman a couple days ago with Bill Gates, is that we are the next um, uh, AI model, his next model anyway, and everyone's going to have it soon, um, is going to be training on your individual data in part. When that happens, we are no longer going to be operating in our present information environment. All of us are going to have AI on, trained with us, helpmates, kind of real time all the time. And th you need to know, we need to understand what it's driving us to do. Unless we are regulating that in a radically different way than the hands-off process on social media, then I, I think the tribalization issue, I think the disinformation issue, I think the atomization of community issue is going to explode. This strikes me as existential for democracy. Um, other questions or thoughts? Uh, Mark, I just wanted to put one thing to you about one, one point that's been put to me in the last few weeks is that one of the elements we're missing about the coincidence of democratic elections in 2024 is what happens to the behaviour of politicians, namely promises. And this will have an impact on debt and spending, that there's a cumulative impact that people are missing. Do you see that? Do you think that there's a pattern in what politicians are promising? 
I think there's a, definitely a kind of mimetic quality to these elections where everyone is sort of copying each other. I think one of the biggest, you know, I, I think that the US election is an existential election for the US, but it is for the world precisely for that reason, that he is creating and legitimating a template for how you do politics, which has its reference right across the world. I think there's a particular challenge um, for, for Europeans in the way that Ian was, was describing. I spent a lot of time in, in Washington at the end of last year talking to the different MAGA tribes about their plans for a dormant NATO and how they want to shift the burden <laughs> rather than uh, share it. Um, and the idea of the kind of war of the administrative state and how they're going to use all the tricks in the book to, to, to have a very, very different kind of administration next time around to, to, to Trump 1.0. Um, and that is something that everybody's sort of looking at. Um, it, I think it's, it's definitely true that if you look at the crises people have been describing here, I spent a lot of time in the geopolitical sessions, there is a sort of technocratic elite idea about what to do in the Middle East and the different elements of, of how we get from where we are now to a better place. And then, uh, and everyone can agree on what the different elements are, what the roadmap is. And then you look at American politics, Israeli politics, what's happening in other places. And by the end of the conversation, you become totally convinced none of this is going to happen. And you can take that for most of the problems we're describing here. So there is definitely a sense yeah. of <clears throat> a sort of functional technocratic imperative in lots of different areas. And then just the dynamics of this very identity-based politics with very different timescales. And I think that does me make 2024 a very, very dangerous year. So, can I, can I just ask you to, and this is slightly unfair, but to ask you to comment on the perspective of the three to four billion people who aren't voting? Because I think one of the facts of the last two decades or so has been this sense uh, amongst democracies, certainly amongst Western democracies, that the argument that was ascendant, you know, a generation ago is losing, and that many people are not so confident that democracy is the way to run their country. What do you think the impact of this year will be, particularly the US election, on the way in which non-democratic countries see democracy? Uh, I don't know enough about American politics to really comment, but let me uh, give the example of India. There, the, uh, the voting percentage or the number of people who are voting, the percentages are very high these days, 70 to 80 percent year after year. And uh, one interesting innovation that our election commission did as part of the uh, 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 case that went all the way up to the Supreme Court was that it created a, in the elect electronic voting machine, it gave an option of uh, none of the above, which basically meant that people who didn't want to vote for any of the candidates on the ballot, they simply went for nota. And there are cases, there are constituencies where nota was getting the majority of the votes. So, I mean, that was one way of, in a, in a sense, registering the f frustration of, uh, you know, a, a set of voters with their, uh, you know, the limited choices that they may have had. I also wanted to talk about the American elections and the, uh, you know, the fairly alarmist view about uh, uh, one candidate in particular. Uh, I mean, one should look at these things uh, in a slightly more dispassionate historical sort of perspective, and which is why I'm uh, mentioning this Indian example, conflict of law, and candidacy. There was a time in the 70s when we had this uh, very strong uh, leader called uh, Mrs. Indira Gandhi. She was convicted of electoral fraud and corruption in the 70s. She refused to accept the convictions. She declared an emergency, a constitutional emergency. She ruled under that emergency for two, two and a half years, I think. Thereafter, she went for elections, roundly defeated. Thereafter, she was in the wilderness for another three, four years. Again thereafter, however, she came back and again won a sweeping electoral victory. So maybe, you know, some of these issues, if you looked at, look at it in a more historical perspective, maybe the blips will not seem that, uh, you know, alarming as it might do in the very near-term perspective. Well, it goes back to the point that Alex was making, that maybe there wasn't this sort of this golden age when everything was quite as neat and tidy as we, as we, th as we think. Um, uh, I will take Secretary Singh your guidance 
to be a little more dispassionate. Um, <laughs> I'm not sure it'll work even to the end of the day, but I'll give it my best, <laughs> uh, I'll, I'll, I'll give it the best try. Um, there is so much to discuss on this. Um, we've tried to touch on as many of the themes as possible within the 45 minutes we've had. Um, I know this is gonna be a conversation that's gonna go through the year, but I hope you felt in, the, in hearing from Ian and Rachel and Mark, uh, Alex and Secretary Singh, it's given you a framework for thinking about the year ahead. Please join me in thanking them and thank you for being part of this panel. Thank you.